let's pick out day three. You see, we uh, have several days to uh, do this, so we won't necessarily rush it. By the time you get to verse 9, it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its own kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Good. G-O-O-D. God plus zero. It's interesting, isn't it? Actually, one of the best evidences that man is made in God's image is that when you finish your job and it looks nice, have you noticed how you actually sit down and say, now that is, it makes you feel right, doesn't it? Yeah. Don't be surprised. You were made in the image of somebody who did that himself. By the time you get to the third day, well, let's take it in bits and pieces. God commanded the waters to be gathered into one place. And the dry land appears, and he calls it earth. Now, there's a couple of clues. You see, on the third day, the water-covered globe, the water actually moves into one spot. Okay, question. How far around is planet earth if you took the diameter? Roughly 25,000 miles? Okay, in one afternoon, 25,000 miles of water is now in one spot. I'd love to see the video replay of this. How about you? Because you see, you and I can't even conceive of the unbelievable catastrophic forces that would have been involved in the Lord saying, move waters, and all of a sudden, 25,000 miles of them. Wow, covering the whole globe. So it's 25,000 miles this way, 25,000 miles this way. By the way, that's a lot of water, don't you reckon? What do you think it might have done? Because you see, immediately after, we hear the uh, words that the dry land appeared. And I have a sneaking suspicion that if you're trying to bring dry land up from where it probably has been, and you are brushing the top off with 25,000 miles of water, you have your first chance to produce layers of what you and I would call sediment. But there won't be any fossils in it. Why not? No life. So you could make a prediction here, and it could go this way if you're trying to be a scientist. Given that Genesis is true, on the third day of creation, I should produce massive amounts of non-fossil bearing sediments. That's your first prediction. And in fact, there's not any necessary information that the air would have been filled with um, oxygen or carbon dioxide yet. In fact, the sediments that have been produced are coming from inside. So even if the air had oxygen and carbon dioxide in, that ground has never been exposed to it. Are you catching up? So the first sediments would give an indication that they never had been exposed to what? Oxygen, carbon dioxide, any of the things that you're familiar with that are now in the atmosphere, because these had never actually been up to the atmosphere. Secondly, when you're looking at the rocks on the inside, you could make a prediction. You see, if you were making a planet that didn't have water, from a chemist's point of view, the rocks would be totally different from a planet that did have water. I read an interesting paper once. It was called, No Water, No Granite, No Granite, No Continents. It was published in my own country from the university there in Canberra. And they made a very good case, you see, because when you actually chemically pull apart granite, guess what a major contributor to the chemistry is? Water. You don't have water, you can't have granite. And since every continent on this planet is based on granite, therefore, on a world that didn't have water, you not only would have no granite, you'd have no continents. But you see, on this planet, you've now got one sea and you've got one continent. Did you catch that? Did they tell you at school that the first book on continental drift was written by a German theologian? Didn't tell me either. It took me an awful lot of research to find that out. And do you know how he argued? He said that Genesis tells us the water was in one place. And if the water was in one place and the only other thing that's mentioned is dry land, guess how many continents there have to be? 
and he won. Hmm. Now that's interesting thought because you see the world continues basically unchanged from this description from day three of creation right up till Noah's flood. And people will ask you, hang on, if the Bible is true, how did koalas and kangaroos get from Australia to Noah's Ark? Well, you now know the answer. There was no Australia. There was no England. I'm sorry, but it's true, right? And there was no Americans, and they're even more disappointed by that. Um, <laughs> you will find that the worst they had to do was hop around the edge of the big pond. Noah was somewhere and the water was in one place. And of course, I've given you a rather exaggerated picture because our, our planet is so small on the overhead. But if all the world was covered by water on the outside on day one and two, and then the Lord raised up the dry land and the water went into one place, then it has to end up somewhere else. 25,000 miles of water makes a deep hole, don't you reckon? Yeah. So don't be surprised from then on you begin to read about things called the fountains of the deep. Now I don't think they would have been right down in the middle, but I'm pretty sure that at the basis of all these land blocks, you would have had massive amounts of stored water. And surprise, surprise, we actually still do. But in reality, there is your picture. Oh, and look, on the third day, there is soil. And it didn't happen by land being exposed to air and water for millions of years. In the morning it wasn't there because there wasn't any land. By the afternoon it was. So question, do you think the mineral balance was just what it was going to need to be? Well, the answer to that is yes, because when God looked at everything he made after he made the plants, everything was very good. And all the minerals were just right. And you see, the land is most of it. And the water, well, you see, I say that because if the water is in one place, on a sphere and the dry land is the rest, the only way you can have that is if the land is most of it. Otherwise the land would be in one place and the water would be the rest. Are you catching on? So therefore on this planet, question, if this planet is later going to be destroyed and this planet has perfect soil and this planet is very good and this planet has the best mineral balance for growing the most luxurious plants you've ever seen and then you're going to destroy this planet very quickly, is there much carbon-based material available for rapidly burying? Answer is yes. You see, I ask it that way because I remember having a debate with Dr. Alex Ritchie in Australia. He's one of our uh, leading anti-creationists. And he made several interesting points. During the discussion, he said, don't you know that the geologic column was invented by creationists? To which the reply is, yes, and they never saw any evidence of evolution at all. And in the beginning, they had no idea of millions of years or the theory of evolution. And you see, the second point they got to be asking was, but if you're going to produce as much coal as we got in the rocks, you'd need three or four or five Noah's floods. Now, how did they get that argument? They looked at England and Australia and America today. And they said, most of Australia is barren. So if you're going to produce as much coal as you've got in Australia, you'd need to take all that vegetation and grow it three or four or five times and bury it after each time. You're catching on? Yeah. Okay, what principle were they using? The present is the key to the past. And don't be surprised that they ended up contradicting the Bible because the man who invented that principle, Charles Lyell, set out to do what? Remove Moses from science. And it's very successful. Very subtle, nobody even sees it as an attack on Genesis. Okay, you see, by the time you get to the end of the third day, you've got uh, luxurious plants because everything is very good, good. Now, you need to catch that one. You see, God, good. Actually, even in English, the two words are related. It's important you understand that. No God, no good. God plus zero equals good. A very important historical origin of those sort of words. In fact, there's one other clue, and you need it for our first dig. Um, you see, in Genesis chapter uh, 1, have a look at verse 11. And as we go out looking for fossils, you'll see it says in verse 11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was 